And at this point, I had been groomed and trained that if I told anybody about my relationship with my stepfather, and I'm using relationship in some giant quotes, that uh, the family would be ripped apart and it would be my fault. And now. <laughs> aye, aye, aye. I'm the captain now. <laughs> Coming to you from the K2 Studios in San Diego, California. This sounds great. You sound amazing. I always sound amazing. It's the world famous. Everybody sitting off like BFS. Chris and Christine Show. Hey, what's happening? How are you doing today? Thank you so much for being here. And I am Chris. And I'm Christine. And welcome to episode 180 of the Chris and Christine Show. Do, 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 do. We're going to do a 180, baby doll. We sure are. We have our favorite Clover, the podcasting puppy, the wild podcasting oh puppy in goodness. studio with us today. Hey, Clover, you think you can take a chill pill and relax for just a minute? You think you can do that for us? She has been just giving us a run for our money in here as we've tried to get this episode started a couple of times. So if you hear a shake, a growl or something like that, she's uh, wandering around the studio. Oh, there she goes. And she's... Chasing her tail. Uh, chasing her tail. So uh, she just loves being in here in the studio with us. It's uh, her favorite yeah, thing. Yeah, I think she just loves being around us the entire time. You know, she <laughs> is so exciting just to watch and be around. She's in one of our moods right now where it's like, <laughs> I, you know, like the mood where you've been sitting in a car ride the entire time, sitting in one seat or even a better, better yet, say you're on an airplane and you're just bundled up in your flight for like a five, six hour flight. Yep. You finally get off the plane. You're just like, I want to run, walk. And yes. Run. It's and the feisty is, mood. That is her. Yeah. Exactly. She's a feisty puppy right now. She's in her full true clover form and she is happy to be here with us today. But how are you doing today, Chris? It is a rainy day here in Southern California. And uh, I know, I know. It, we don't always get the rain, but what we do, <laughs> we don't like it, you know, at It's all. been all weekend, really. Yeah, this weekend. You know, what's funny about Southern California is that most of the time it's all sunny and fun. You want to go out to the beach. You want to go bike riding. You want to go out and do stuff and physically be outside, go and go and do places, go and things. But when it's like rainy and gloomy weather, everybody just kind of wants to bundle up inside and just like... You eat some chili and just kind of. Oh like- my gosh, you and chili. You, <laughs> it's chilly first of weather. all, you're getting chili tonight. You are, and it is chili, and I made chili, but you have not stopped talking about chili all weekend long. Like last night, we were trying to figure out what, like, it's six o'clock already. And I was like, what do you want for dinner? You know what sounds good? Some homemade chili. I'm like, you could have asked me that four hours ago so I could put it on to simmer, but. You, you wanted me to start it at six o'clock? No, sir. Well, I was do quick chili. You know how, okay, recipe for all you fellows out there. The quick chili basically is you get the can of chili. It says chili on it. Can't miss it. It says chili around the, the can. <laughs> and then you What can, are you even talking about? Like, uh, and then you heat it up on the stovetop, sprinkle in a little flavoring, maybe add in a dice and some onion and some other veggies, maybe, you know, if you want. That's like faux chili. No, oh. that's like chili from the can. I'm talking about no, really you, did, chili. Did you hear the part about me adding extra fluff to it? <laughs> that doesn't count. <laughs> yeah, you add extra goofball. seasoning to it. And then me add some extra beans to it and you cook it on a pot or, you know, however you want to do it. Heat that thing up for about, you know, a little while until it's boiling. And then it's good to serve. You know? <laughs> until it's boiling hot. <laughs> Clover, what's going on with you? My goodness. She's being crazy right now. We're going to take a quick pause because Clover is being crazy. We are back. We uh, had to remove the podcasting puppy from the podcasting studio. She was going nutso in here. We had to put her on timeout. It's we like did. Clover timeout. You know, <laughs> you had your fun. You think you'd be cool. It's like, I could be cool. I'm going to be good. It's like you tell little kids the same thing, too. It's like, hey, if we go to the store, you better behave. Yeah, I'll be fine. If you don't behave, we're taking you right out of here and we're going home. And the funny thing is, a lot of grown ups or adults, they fail to do that when right. they actually, because they, we all know we got to get stuff done at the store. We have to get stuff done. We have to get this podcast done, you know, for all the millions of fans out there. So regardless of Clover's attitude, we got to remove Clover like you probably <laughs> should with your child, remove them from the store and then continue shopping. 
This this podcast episode is devolving so quickly. Well, let's get us ourselves back on track. So this week has been a very interesting turn of events as we've had a lot happening around the house, haven't yeah. we? Yes, we have. Uh, do you want to tell everybody the uh, where you went yesterday? Uh, no, I want to start off first with Ezekiel's birthday. So, oh, that's right. Ezekiel had a birthday. Yeah, he Ezekiel, wasn't here in town, though. No, Ezekiel turned 19 on wow. Thursday. Um, but little, little rock star over there, he has been making the rounds to the open mic nights. And he has been going to... You know, anywhere from one to three a week and really building out his comedy routine. And he's been sending them to me and getting lots of laughs and so proud of him for putting himself out there. Really funny jokes and bits that he's come up with. But yeah, he, it's great. Yeah, but he had his birthday on Thursday and I will be leaving on Tuesday night to go up to central California for about four days and I'll be able to um, get the family together to celebrate him while I'm up there. Oh, nice. Nice. Now being that you weren't here or he wasn't with you on your birthday, on his birthday, how'd that make you feel? Uh, Well, you know, I've kind of gotten used to it. We've had this kind of a rhythm for the past eight years. So it's not new. Uh, I mean, I'm always sad. I mean, he's, my firstborn, my, you know, my baby, but, oh, you ask a deep question. I wasn't ready to, to get in contact with those emotions today, but, you know, I just think of, I'm so proud of him. He's 19. We did spend a good chunk of the day on FaceTime the evening on Thursday before he went out to dinner because he had statistics homework for college and he was stuck on the concepts and so um, I use my new ring light set up to put my phone down so that it would be over a notebook so he could see the work. And we did the work together and worked out the different equations because I'm actually, statistics is my area of specialty. Oh, nice. Statistically speaking, you yeah, are as good as statistics. statistically speaking, <laughs> I am statistically significantly yet. Yeah. Anyway, so uh, got to spend some good time and we would chat in between the problems that we were solving uh, but he caught on pretty quickly. And so that was really helpful, but it was nice while I wasn't able to be there on his actual birthday for us to spend some quality time virtually together. That's very nice. You know, yeah. I, I, I'm trying to think back to my 19th birthday. It was only like a few years ago. Um, it was like yesterday. <laughs> it was like yesterday. I know. I, I can remember like at least here, the casinos used to be 18 and up to get in. Mm -hmm. And we tell you 18th birthday, 19th birthday is all about the casinos here. And I would spend my measly allowance of like $6, you know, in mm -hmm. one little spin, you know, poof, gone. But um, I used to do that kind of stuff uh, when I was his age. You know, I didn't mm -hmm. have any, I wanted to do comedy back then, but there wasn't any open mic nights that I can think of. Maybe there was, but I don't remember. I'm so proud of Ezekiel doing the open mic night and, and trying to get his passion, his foot in the door with the whole comedy scene. And I think he, what he's doing is he's building confidence. Not so much, even with like, even with like you think about the comedy thing, but like even doing something like open mic night or even doing something like this podcast here is it's going to build your confidence so that if you go into, say, a job interview, right, you pretty much can like, I wouldn't say nail it, but you can have the confidence to answer questions and not like feel like you're just kind of, um, um, I don't know, um, right. uh, uh, you know, you're nervous. You, you're, mm -hmm. You'll fall back in this corner where you're like, I don't know what to say because I'm so nervous and I don't know how to talk right. to people and stuff. So um, that should hopefully, you know, build some confidence. Yeah, absolutely. And it definitely has. He's been just really coming out of his shell. But, you know, January is always a crazy month for us because on Thursday, the 18th, we have Ezekiel's birthday. And then on the 19th, we have Jacob's birthday. So we had a celebration for Jacob turning 14, didn't we? Absolutely. He wanted to go racing. And I said, Here, here's the keys to the car. You know, don't crash it. You know, have fun. <laughs> no, he actually wanted to go to K1 Speed, which is an indoor electric race car company track. Go-kart, right? Yeah, go-karts, go but a um, they're all electric. They don't use gas ones for this 
company, although there are ones that do gas. This one just is strictly with electric. I've raced them before. And I'm getting too old to go racing because it it's rough when you're out there and you're whipping around the track at like 40 miles an hour and you're colliding with the different cars and you're colliding to the sides of the thing. When I was done doing the races before, I would like for a week straight afterwards would be like, oh, I'm so sore. Because you feel like you've been in a car crash. Even right. a little car crash, if, you know, but um, you feel sore. And the kids, it was just so funny is that we were kind of thinking that Jacob was old enough to do the adult track. They have they have the adult class of cars and they have the junior class of cars. Now, the junior class, they're like half the speed. They're for like kids, you know, which they've done before. So we go there. Jacob, you know, measured good enough to race with the adult class. Okay, that's fine. What about poor little Mason? Because Mason wanted to ride too. Right. He wanted to do the racing too. And because they were like, well, Mason does the junior thing and then Jacob does the adult thing. They're going to be racing different things and different times and all this. And and she measured uh, Mason against the wall there. It turns out Mason was barely tall enough to also race in the adult class. Rock star. Yeah. So I said, you guys sure you want to do this? This is going to be like a lot faster than the other cars you've ris- raced before. Like twice as fast. Yeah, yeah, I want to do it now. Let's do this. And so they both raced together. And the first race they did was just the two of them racing together, just getting familiar with the cars because they're so much faster than the other cars they've raced. And then they did that. I bought three races for the kids to do. And on the second two races, they were both in an entire class of adults. All these these two kids, two little kids, Mason and Jacob, racing against an entire group of grownups. And these grownups are going like, nuts just you know well i'm sorry to break it to you but jacob is not a little kid he is now like almost as tall as me he's that is four, true yes that is true 14 so he is just within spitting distance of going to high school so i'm sorry to break it to you old man but your baby is like a year and a half away from having his learner's permit. That's crazy. Yeah. Well, I guess if you can reach the pedals, you can uh, you can drive. But both kids raced in the adult class go-karts against adults in two different races. And they were getting slammed around a little bit, bumped around a little bit. But surprisingly, they both finished like middle of the pack. Right. Which is kind of, at first, the first race I think they did, they were a little towards the back of the pack, like on the scoreboard. They were like the last two uh, drivers in the race. But on the second race, they both finished like, I think Mason finished like in fifth and Jacob finished like in seventh. Yeah. Well, they were super excited to be able to go there and to race each other. And then uh, Jacob had said he wanted to have a steak dinner for dinner that night. So we took him to Claim Jumper right down on the waterfront here in San Diego, which is across from the Star of India pirate ship, which was lit up so perfectly. It was a great view. And um, man, we had the best server. Her name was Edna. And she was, I would say, one of the top five servers I've ever had in terms of- Well, in terms of her customer service and just her kind demeanor. And she really was, you know, like, pumping it up for Jacob's birthday, brought him a birthday cake and had everybody singing to him in the whole dining room. And we still came home and we did cake and presents for him, but it was for him, it was really special. And, you know, one of the things that I appreciate about our kids, and we were even talking about this, is that as they are starting to grow up, uh, they're starting to show so much more appreciation when we make an effort for them. And as a parent, you know, Zeke being just so appreciative of the time I spent with him doing math homework with him and um, Jacob being so appreciative of his birthday celebration. It just reminds me of just how important it is for us to be so present in our kids' lives and trying to be like a good healthy model for them. It does make a big difference because uh, kids feed off that stuff and they do see that stuff and they do, they do see when you are put in the effort to be there for your kids in moments of hardship and moments of joy, they, it, hopefully it's, uh, it goes sticks with them as they go into adulthood. Absolutely. And, you know, speaking of that this week, we have a great guest who's going to talk about her life journey and overcoming some really challenging 
instances of interacting with her parent and her life story. And it really is, um, it's enlightening. It's um, a story of resilience, of empowerment and of overcoming and of healing. And I think that you're going to get a lot out of it. So we do want to give a little bit of a trigger warning because uh, depending on what your background is, if you come from a background where you've had a situation of abuse or um, a parental abandonment, this may be triggering for you. So we do want to leave, leave a little trigger warning um, in advance, but we do hope that you'll take the opportunity to listen in to this heartfelt interview that we have. And we're going to be back with our guest, Jesse, right after this. Enjoy listening to podcasts and ever wonder, can I make a podcast? But it seems so complicated and good audio production can take time. What if there was a way to create an amazing podcast easily? Well, now there is. Introducing Podcasting Made Easy from Podtastic Audio. My production team will handle your entire audio production, allowing you to be the star of your show. This is Podcasting Made Easy. How easy? Well, so easy, you don't even have to press record. Now that's easy. Your listeners are waiting. Let's deliver. Sign up for a free strategy call today at podtasticaudio.com slash easy. And welcome back, everybody. Today, we have another fantastic VIP guest. She has a true story of overcoming. We're excited to have her on the show today. Please welcome Jesse Renee Gibbs. Hi, Chris and Christine. Thank you so much for having me on your show. Hey, Jesse. How are you doing today? Not too shabby. It's a beautiful, sunny day here in Seattle, so I'm enjoying every minute what? of it. You got the sun. We're down here in San Diego. We got the rain. We flip-flop today. What's up oh, with that? Oh, that's so unfair. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, we. it's like a very dreary day, which is very atypical, but uh, it was feeling a, a lot like Seattle today here. Oh, I bet. Oh, my goodness. So Seattle, I took the kids there just a couple of years ago and was in like the Space Needle area. Do you live in like Seattle proper or the Burbs? We actually live in a tiny little suburb of Seattle called Des Moines. Des Moines, they do pronounce the S. Okay. Um, and it's just a little retirement village on the waterfront. Um, we're not actually on the waterfront, but we're close enough that we can hear the, um, uh, what are they called? The big horns that go off on the waterfront. Oh, is it like a foghorn or something? Foghorns, yes. Got it. It's very romantic when it gets all foggy here and the wind's coming off the ocean and you hear the foghorns in the background. Well, other than my little visit for a couple of days uh, three years ago, the extent of my knowledge of Seattle is related to Grey's Anatomy. Oh, okay. Yep, yep, fair. So, Wait, I, that, know, that was in Seattle? Yes, it was in Seattle. Oh, I don't honey. know. It was in Seattle, definitely. So, yeah, that's the extent of, of what I know about it. But it is a beautiful city, and we went and went to, like, the Pikes Place Market and all of those oh, things. Oh, yes. Do you have a favorite place to visit in the Seattle area? Um, so my husband and I are swing dancers, and there is a very old building, and there is a, a ballroom called the Century Ballroom. It's really fun. Uh, gorgeous hardwood floors. It's still got all, like, the vintage curtains, and we go swing dancing there as often as we can. That sounds so fun. You know, Chris, we've never been swing dancing. I think that- I don't think we've been dancing really much at all. I don't know. I think that we would struggle because I'm not a good follower when it comes <laughs> to you, dancing. Yeah, you can tell me yeah, you, for sure. Yeah, I can, I can vouch for that <laughs> mm -hmm. for sure. So I actually used to teach um, East Coast Swing, which is kind of a starter swing dance in uh, Chicago when I lived there. And what we would do is whenever we had married couples or dating couples that would come into our class, the first thing we'd do is break them up. Ugh. Like you go over here, you dance with him, you come over here, you dance with her or vice versa. And we're going to get you set up so that you can start practicing with other people because what tends to happen in couples is one or the other will be like, you're doing it wrong. You're, you're doing it. You're stepping on my feet, but you're not going to do that to a stranger, right? Yeah, um, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it's it's a really fun dance to learn. My um, my first dance partner used to say, he he's like, Jesse, I love swing dancing with you. And I was like, oh, thank you. And he goes, yeah, it's the only time in our entire relationship that you listen. Oh. So, wow. first of all, I did not ask to be called out like this. Second of all, <laughs> yeah, kind of. <laughs> 
Well, I get in this wormhole on Instagram and TikTok. There's these these um, reels that come on and these little videos of these couples that go to like dancing improv competitions and yep. they get paired up with random different partners and, you know, they play a song and they have to come up with, you know, whatever on the spot. Yep. And it is just so fascinating to me how people can read one another's body language on the dance floor and how far away from that I am. It's it's definitely a learned skill for sure. So how long have you been a dancer? Um, since I was 28. I'm 46 now. So whatever that math is, 18 years, I guess, something like that. Awesome. And was it something that you just stumbled into or was it like you were actively pursuing wanting to become a dancer? No. So for my 28th birthday, I was married to my first husband um, and I was living in an inner city commune in Chicago. And my husband's friend, Nate, is this adorable redhead um, who is my age. Uh, my my ex was 12 years older than me. Um, and Nate and Leonard, my ex-husband, were friends. And we're all sitting around like talking and hanging out. And he's like, hey, Jesse, for your 28th birthday, do you want to go swing dancing? And I was like, Literally never thought about it. And he's like, you should go swing dancing with me. And I was like, okay. And my ex, my ex-husband was like, got all pouty and was like, well, I don't want to go swing dancing. I'm, 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 I'm. <laughs> and Nate was like, Leonard, you're being dumb. I'm taking your wife dancing for her birthday. And we Aww. did. And I was hooked. I was absolutely hooked. He taught me just a couple of basic steps, just enough to get out on the dance floor. Um, I danced with a couple of people. I danced with him several times. I watched all of the incredibly talented dancers that were hanging out in Chicago. And I was hooked. I started taking classes. Um, I would go dancing at uh, the college every once in a while. And um, any bands that we found that were playing swing music, we'd go there. Um, There's this tiny little bar in uptown Chicago called um, the Green Mill Lounge. It was uh, built in the 1920s and it was part of Prohibition. And um, Al Capone actually had a booth there. He might've been the owner, I can't remember, but there's actually uh, a trap door behind the... A bar and you can go down the stairs and there's tunnels that go all the way across the street and into different buildings <gasps> all around uptown Chicago. Yeah. That's and so that's cool. where they would that, they would that, they smuggle all the alcohol to the bars? That's where they would smuggle the alcohol into the bars. <sighs> yep. So it's like a speakeasy. It's like it's- Totally like a speakeasy. That's and so cool. every Thursday, and they might still do this, but every Thursday there is a 15 piece big band that shows up and squeezes into this tiny little bar. And the dance floor is literally a postage stamp. And you'll have like 50 <laughs> people out there just squished in together, just dancing their butts off. And it is magic. And everybody comes like dressed to the nines. No way. Like nobody shows up in G. It's, it's magic. And it's just this tiny little hidey hole in uptown Chicago. That is so cool. It makes me think of like a time warp back to the scenes from the movie, The Notebook, where you see right? them like out dancing and swing dancing. And do you go to these like swing dancing events where the gals are all dressed up with like their throwback outfits? Lots you, of hats with feathers. Yeah. Like their Absolutely. little fascinators and the things. fascinators. Yes. <gasps> I have a huge collection of fascinators. It's ridiculous. <gasps> it's basically cosplay for grownups, you know? I want to Live your um, life, Jesse. It's so fun. We actually just got back from Burbank, California. So um, there is uh, we we dance swing or Lindy Hop, um, and then we also dance um, a sort of an offshoot of Lindy called Balboa, which was popularized in the 1940s. It was actually invented in 1915, but it was popularized in the 1940s because during the war. Uh, swing dance kind of became the symbol of what we were fighting for, you know? Mm. And so in the dance halls in California and New York, it was standing room only. And a, a Lindy swing out or like the basic step of a swing out, you need to have enough room for two people to stand arm's length away from each other. That's a swing out, right? Mm -hmm. And so the dance floors were so packed, you couldn't do a swing out. So Balboa became popular. And the best way to describe Balboa is, if you remember those old tiny cartoons where like their faces were pressed together and their feet were going super fast, that's Balboa. And so my, my 
current husband, the man that I love, uh, introduced me to Bao when we got together uh, many years ago, and I was I was instantly hooked. It is so much fun. And then we also dance blues, which blues is, I guess the best way to describe blues is blues dance sound feels like what blues music sounds like. It's low and it's slow and it's sexy and it's magic and it's really like, it's not necessarily athletic, but it's like yoga for dancers, I guess. Oh. Um, and it's oh, so much fun. Oh my gosh. <laughs> it sounds amazing. Well, you know, we want to learn more about the start of your story, but I'm actually going to pop us right into the center of your story because I was stalking you on TikTok. And by the way, you're so interesting. And I love the way that you tell stories and uh, you've definitely got a follower in me. But Thank I you. was so fascinated with the story of how you and your husband, your now husband and the love of your life, met is as you were, can I get the term right? A taxi dancer? I was a taxi dancer. Yes. Okay. First of all, you, you got to da- tell- dance on taxis. Exactly. Yes. You got to no. tell everybody what that is. <laughs> so a taxi dancer is basically you get like some of the more seasoned dancers and they wear like a black and white checkered scarf around their arm. And that tells anybody, the new dancers, the older dancers, um, that you will say yes to anyone who asks. Because when you first start dancing, um, you tend to have this mindset of like junior high school, like, oh God, is she going to like me? Do I like her? Da, da, da. It's like, that's not what dancing is about. We don't do that. Um, and so as a taxi dancer, it was my job to basically invite all of the new dancers out on the dance floor. Um, and the the dance scene, at least in Seattle, well, the places that I've danced, Seattle, California, New York, are very inclusive. So there's leads and follows. It's not necessarily boys against girls. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And so I'm dancing with everybody. And in comes this new guy. No, understand. I had been single for a little less than a year. It was the first time I had not been responsible for another human being in my entire life. Mm-hmm. I was very happy being single. Thank you very much. And um, here comes this new guy. And I was like, hey, new guy, let's get on the dance floor. And I kind of won the lottery because... <laughs> He was a very good dancer. Oh, kind, kind of swept me off my feet. Oh, um, literally. So I, so, so, so I asked him to dance again, and and again and again. I think we danced like five or six times that night. And I invited him to come out to um, uh, Odd Duck Studios was hosting a blues dance the following week, and it just happened to be on my birthday. Now I told him point blank. After the fact, of course, you can't take that personally. I invited a bunch of people to my birthday party. You really can't take that personally. Come Mm -hmm. on. And he showed up. And I was like, oh, oh, okay. Well, I noticed that he showed up. But I mean, so in the dance world, especially in blues dance, you get out on the dance floor and you are the most beautiful human being for three whole minutes. And it's magic. And then, you know, you light a cigarette, you take a big poof and you walk on, thank you, and walk on to the next person, right? Aww. It's just fantastic. It feeds all of the physical touch that I really needed in my life because I didn't get that in my previous life. Um, and so I it, I just, like, the dopamine poisoning was fantastic. And so in the dance world, there's sort of this unwritten rule that if you get what we call a dance crush, you go, oh, boy, oh, I'm really hot. I think I'm going to step outside and cool off. And if they're interested, they follow you. Oh. So he followed me and we never actually made it back into the dance because we sat outside and talked and talked and talked. And at one o'clock, one of my friends comes out with my purse, which I had left in the, in the building. And he's like, yeah, they're locking the doors. And I was like, <laughs> oh, okay. And then he walked me back to the car all right, well, uh uh-oh. So there's a huge difference in dating in your teens and 20s than there is in dating as an, as an adult, like Mm -hmm. in your 30s, right? Right. Um, And I, I was raised in a awful abusive Judeo-Christian family where I was to marry the man that my mother picked out for me, have 12 children, and live on her property and care for her in her old age. That's how I was what? raised. Oh, it- Wait, it, let's go back yes. to that se- segment. You said that she picked out your mate uh-huh. to marry? 
She yes. picked she picked out, not you, yes. but she mm-hmm. picked out. Yep. Okay. That sounds like it's prearranged. Uh-huh. Wow. Okay. And she did not have good taste in men, but that's yeah. another story. Well, they usually don't, you know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's pause on the story of how you met your now husband because your journey it is Chris and I were talking as we were prepping for the interview. It's fascinating and appalling and heartbreaking and also speaks to your resilience. And there's really not one word to describe it. And, you know, we were reading some of the, like the reviews on your story. Sometimes it's it's almost so much and so deep that it's it's hard to believe that all of this life has happened to one person who's still here standing in front of us and now happily surviving and thriving and continuing to heal. So with all of that being said, as the preview, can we go back to a little bit of the beginning of your story and your origins? Like where do, where were you born and raised and, and what led you to where you're at now? Um, so I was born on a naval base in Rota, Spain. My mother had joined the Navy at 19. Um, you have to understand, my mom was a deeply troubled child. Mm. Um, long story there, but she had her first um, illegal abortion when she was 13. And to our knowledge, she had six abortions before her 19th birthday. Um, and I was born when she was 19. I was to be another one of her abortions, but she found out that if she was pregnant, she could be dishonorably discharged from the Navy and go home. Was that her plan to get out? That that was her plan. So she didn't want a child. So she contacted a lawyer and they found a sweet family um, that was going to adopt me. They had set up their nursery. And three weeks before I was born, mama found out that if she kept the baby, she could get out of the military. But if she gave the baby up, they would give her a few weeks to recover. And then it was back to work. Well, at that point, how many years left did she have to serve in her in her ter- tour of duty or whatever it is? 18 months. She only had 18 months to go? hmm So she wanted to get out of the 18 months? hmm Got it. Okay. Yep. So three weeks before I was born, she decided to keep me. Um, and then she spent the next three months trying to kill me. Uh, she would uh, leave me alone in the apartment to go out partying. Um, she, I have, so my grandmother was extremely meticulous in the items that she kept. And, um, before she passed, uh, she gifted me 45 boxes of files and court documents and journals and every letter that my mother wrote to her when I, she was pregnant with me and after I was born. Wow. Um, so I have a stack of all of these letters with notes telling her mom that this little um, B word uh, is so demanding and thinks that she can eat whenever she wants to instead of on the schedule that I think she should have. Speaking of you, an infant with no means to care for yourself. Yes. Wow. Um, I have a letter from the doctor at the three-week mark. Um, Basically, so CPS was a different situation both in the military, in Rota, Spain, and in the 70s. So things were a lot different back then. I I think they've improved quite a bit, though there is obviously a lot to go. Um, But there's a letter from the doctor saying that I had lost so much weight in three weeks. Because, of course, after babies born, they usually lose like a a percentage of their weight and then they gain it back fairly quickly. Um, And I had lost so much weight because my mother was starving me. Mm. Um, that they said, the doctor basically said that if I didn't gain weight in the next three days, that he was calling the police. Wow. So three months after I was born, a mama, uh, flew back to, uh, Washington state, uh, where my grandparents were moved back in with her mom and dad, and then proceeded to drop me off on her mother so that she could go out partying again because mm. she didn't want to be a mom. How old, was your, how old was your mom at the time? 19. She was 19. So she had you when she when she was 19. Uh-huh. 
And at that point, she didn't want I me. Mean, if you think about it, like a lot of 19 year old women, to, even today, if they were to have a child today, whether they wanted the child or not, I think that being that young, having a child, it's a lot of responsibility. You know, it is. You, what's interesting, Jesse, is our oldest just turned 19 two days ago. And so oh, goodness. we're thinking like an, a boy, but, you know, different, but still the same. Like I'm thinking he, he, of course, wouldn't be birthing a child himself, but, you know, for him to become a parent at this age, as wonderful of a human as he is, like, it's it's not the time. <laughs> Hugely challenging. Like, it's a giant gear shift having a kid, even if you're, you know, 25 and in a healthy relationship with a home and a yard and whatever else you need to raise a baby or you think you need to raise a baby. Right. Your your brain isn't even fully developed until you're 25. Right. And one of the things that was a huge challenge in writing the book was I wrote part of the book from mama's perspective, mm. using the notes, the letters, um, and the court documents to sort of flesh out who she was at that age and see if I could step away from the version of the her that I knew who was a monster and recognize that she was a very troubled 19 year old. Mm. Well, it says she's out partying a lot and she wanted to go out partying versus uh -huh. taking care of a, a newborn baby, which doesn't sound like she'd be getting mother of the year award if you ask me, but, no. um, but I can see how somebody who's 19, 20, even 21 who is probably has issues, probably has low self-esteem, I, I would imagine, and is probably wanting to get attention from fellas. And, and uh -huh. um, you know, especially, especially at that age, you are still coming to your own. You're still trying to like figure out the world and you want to get attention from the guys. And Christine's got a, got a question. Yeah. So, you know, something you said, Chris, kind of made me think in, in your story though, Jesse, you, you talk about, the narcissistic patterns of your mom. So do you think she was low self-esteem or do you think that she was scheming along the way? Well, from what I understand, most narcissists actually have very low self-esteem. Got it. Um, and I, I could be I could be wrong on that, but that's my understanding of it. Um, I definitely think that she has, if, if not schizophrenic, which has also been... Uh, discussed with her um, her sisters, her brother, and her parents, um, but also narcissistic personality disorder uh, because like there are, there are just little hints, um, little proofs throughout. I have a journal that she wrote about some of the abuses that she did on one of my brothers. Mm -hmm. um, and she'll be halfway through writing a sentence and the way that she writes changes. Mm. Not just in the tone, but the style of writing itself changes. So there's even a possibility that she has disassociative identity disorder. I have no idea. But what you do know is that that first start in life was rough, to put it lightly. Very traumatic, yes. So you mentioned that you have a grandparent that her mother that was in your scope of your environment growing up. So mom moved home, you're a newborn, grandma's there. What role did she take in your upbringing? Oh boy. So grandma was the safe person. Mm. Um, so she basically took over as caregiver for me and mama would go out partying and then whenever grandma would be like, Hey, I need you to stay home and be a responsible parent. She would leave and take me with her and leave me on the floor or with whoever while she goes out and drinks and does drugs and parties. And so that would scare my grandmother so badly that she would start taking care of me again. Mm. When I was two, um, my mother married a man uh, named Greg and decided to move me and her to Canada to start a life. Um, I was there for six months. She came back, dropped me off at my grandmother's house and said, I have to go save my marriage. You have to watch my daughter. Mm. And grandma said, no, 
you will sign over full guardianship of Jesse to me. Wow. And mama was like, absolutely, you can have her and sign the papers. Wow, that I didn't even think about it. And she said, oh, see you later. Because that, and most, most people, I would think, would be like, well, maybe think about that, you know, like, but no, she just said, that's it, huh? Nope. So that was the second time that I was basically put up for adoption. Um, let's see, I think it was six months later, mama got started her divorce proceedings and moved back in with her parents and me. Mm. Um, Grandma worked as a uh, secretary for junior high school and she got up one morning and knocked on mama's door and was like, you know, Jessie's up. She's changed. You need to get her breakfast. I have to go to work. And mama came out and said, I had an abortion yesterday and I need to go to the hospital right now. Oh my gosh. Now, they were living on Vashon Island, which means the closest hospital is a ferry right away. Um, so I she put me in the front seat of the car. Obviously, this was pre-seat built. Uh, Mama sat in the back seat and um, the kind of abortion that she had, it basically induced labor. Um, and so she delivered uh, a fetus in the back of the car and on the ferry, and I was two and saw the whole thing. Um, and m- grandma got her to the local abortion clinic, and they apparently would not even come out to check on my mother until a check was written. So grandma paid for that abortion. Oh, goodness. Um, and my grandparents are very pro life. I am very pro choice. Um, but that's, you know, neither here nor there. Uh, but so for my grandmother, that was also a very traumatic experience. And then shortly after, mama packed her bags and disappeared to North Carolina. Wow. Um, at that point, they had a family meeting. And my aunt, uh, Mabel, who is just my absolute love, I love my aunties both so much, um, was in the place in her life that she wanted to have a baby. And so she and I had a great relationship. She was an artist. She was very artistic, very kind, uh, very fun. Um, And she was like, I will absolutely take Jessie. So I moved in with her. Uh, That lasted less than nine months because her husband at the time, now ex-husband, basically sat her down and said, if we ever get divorced, I don't want to pay child support. You have to give Jesse back. Oh my gosh. So they put me in the middle of the room again. Who's going to take her? And my grandparents were the only ones who were in the mental and financial position to take on a child. And you have to understand, not only was I traumatized by all of these situations at this point, by the time I was four, my grandmother had me tested um, for uh, an extremely high IQ. Uh, I have I found the test when I was going through the paperwork and found out that I had an IQ of 145 when I was four years old. Wow. Is that good? I, I have no idea what that means. That's Mensa status. No. Oh. Absolutely. Very, very high IQ. Nice. Uh, the problem with that, however, is you have an understanding of what's going on, but you don't have the emotional capacity to regulate that situation, whatever situation. Like just as an example, I remember being on the boat. Grandpa was a Navy man and a fisherman of some great legend in his own mind. And so he was always out on the boat. And once a month, grandma would go out with him and have an adventure. And so when I started living with them full time, I became part of that experience. And they'd put me in my little life jacket and off we'd go onto the Puget Sound. And I remember being in the boat and I was telling my therapist about this at one point. Um, I remember thinking, you know, grandma is not a great swimmer and she's old. And grandpa would not be able to save both of us if the boat tips over. Which means he's going to have to choose between me and his wife. Hmm. And of course he's going to choose his wife, which means I would drown or get eaten by a shark. Hmm. And I'm telling this to my therapist and she goes, Jesse, you realize that a a healthy four-year-old would literally tell that story and be like, no, grandpa would stand up on top of the water, pick me, grandma, and the boat up and walk across the water to the shore. 
Like that's magical thinking. You still have that when you're a small person. And I, I didn't, I didn't have that huge imagination, but a lot of dark um, thoughts because I understood death at a very early age. Death and loss and abandonment, I'd say. Yep. So with that early start, uh, did things get better for you after four years old when you're with grandma and grandpa? Or did you continue to have a rough experience through childhood? Ooh, loaded question. Um, So when I was five, uh, my mother sent her mother a letter um, explaining where she was in life. She had uh, gotten remarried. She literally signed the divorce papers, walked across the hall to the next judge and married her last hu- her next husband. Wow. All the same day, huh? On the same day, within wow. an hour. Well, let's call that efficiency right there. <laughs> and mama was never without a man. She could not survive without it. Well, might explain all the abortions and might explain that kind of stuff. Well, I mean, when she was 13, she was five foot 10 and looked like Wonder Woman. She was beautiful. 13? 13, she was five foot 10 with a size 11 shoe. Wow. Wow. Yeah. And fully developed at 13, which is why she was dating college boys at that point. Right. Yeah. Troubled child. Anyway, um, so she sent my grandmother a letter. It said, I'm involved in this church. Turned out this church was actually uh, a part of a cult. Um, if you've seen the documentary, Shiny Happy People, which I highly recommend, hard watch, but good. It's about the Duggar family, um, oh, the yeah. 16 well, kids yeah. and counting. Mm-hmm. Well, 19 or 20, I think it is, but whatever it is. Yeah, yeah a lot. Um, that was how I was raised, was under Bill Gothard's tutelage. And there's a lot of abuses that Bill Gothard not only preached, but encouraged um, in, as far as raising kids was concerned. Um, and that's that's what I, my mother, how my mother was choosing to raise her children. Um, and her and my stepfather had proceeded to have two boys at this point. So I had a three-year-old little stepbrother and a one-year-old little stepbrother. And so she writes this letter to my grandmother and is like, you know, I've got my life together. I would like my daughter back. And grandma was like, when hell freezes over. Right. A month later, she sent a letter to her father. Now understand, my grandfather and I have had discussions as adults about this situation. Grandpa's a good man. But also trying to understand where his head was at. He had just retired from the Navy and was looking forward to traveling and having life experiences with his wife. And all of a sudden, he has an emotionally traumatized, highly intelligent, high needs, five-year-old little girl running around all over the place. And he didn't want that. And so he said yes. And my grandmother, uh, very upset with the situation, um, but... Um, believing that as a good Christian woman, she needed to submit to her husband's rule, uh, loaded me up, loaded up a suitcase, and we flew to North Carolina. Um, And I met my mother and my new stepfather and my two little brothers in the airport. (laughs) And grandma handed me my teddy bear and went to get back on the plane. And I, I stopped her and I handed her back my teddy bear my little brown bear with the little glass eyes. Because I knew if she kept Timmy, that she would come back to make sure that I got Timmy back. Mm. And you were how old at this time? I was five. Wow. So I moved in with the Taylors. And my mother at the time was part of an organization called WEBA. uh, W-E-B-A, it stands for Women Exploited by Abortion. She was very anti-medicine, naturopathic, all the things, uh, didn't believe that because she was pro-life that doctors were trying to kill her. Um, She was traveling all over the country at the time doing uh, speaking engagements at different events and churches. And um, I was being taught that wearing pants was evil, that girls should always wear long dresses. Um, because boys will sexualize you if you are not wearing a dress. Wow. I was five. I was five. 
And that if I was going to grow up and be a good Christian wife and mother, which was the only choice that I had in life, that I was to practice this lifestyle with my stepfather. What, what, hold on. What lifestyle? The uh, lifestyle? I, I can cook, tell. I cook, cooked for him. Mm-hmm. I cleaned up after him. I did his laundry. Um, I prayed for him every day. I would leave him little love notes because mama said that is one of the things to do. And um, uh, it got to a point very shortly after moving, moving in with the Taylors where they would go into the boys' room, which was right next to mine, and they would sing Jesus songs to my brothers and pray with them, and they would put them to bed. And then they would come into my room and pray with me, and then mama would go to her bedroom and papa would stay in mine. Right. So what they were doing was at first treating you as if you're a sister wife and grooming you. Yes. And then because, I mean, we can, we can forecast it for a lot of different reasons in a way that he probably justified it is you weren't his biological daughter and then you were exploited and violated. Is that Bingo. what happened? Yep. Yeah. And I was supposed to stay with the Taylors. Uh, It was a three-month test to see how things worked out. In those three months, uh, my mother started um, any letters or boxes that I got from the aunties or my grandmother were uh, denied or even ripped to pieces and mailed back to her. Um. She uh, unplugged all of the phones, stopped paying the phone bill, so there was no contact with the outside world. And I was informed that my grandparents had abandoned me. Um, 18 months later, my grandmother, who still had legal custody of me, remember, finally got a hold of my mother and was like, I will be on a plane in two days. I will be at your front door and I will be bringing the sheriff if you don't give me access to my granddaughter. And mama was like, oh, I don't, I don't understand. I don't know why you're so upset. I mean, we're just doing all of this, you know, safety things, this, you know, we're just trying to, you know, keep things quiet in our house and whatever other excuses she came up with. Um, and grandma showed up. And at this point, I had been groomed and trained that if I told anybody about my relationship with my stepfather, and I'm using relationship in some giant quotes, that uh, the family would be ripped apart and it would be my fault and Papa would go to jail and I would have to live with that guilt on my conscience for the rest of my life. So I didn't say anything. And Mama did a really good job of the five days that Grandma was there keeping me and her from having private conversations at all. Right. She was constantly over my shoulder. On the fourth day, my grandmother literally got in mama's face, which is kind of hard. Grandma's five foot nothing and little tiny Irish redhead and weighs, you know, 100 pounds dripping wet. My mother's five foot 10 uh, and a big girl. And it was like, I have full custody of Jessie. I'm taking her out to lunch. Do not argue with me about this. If you do, I'm just taking her with me. So we went out to lunch. We sat in the car and had chicken McNuggets. And grandma's like, okay, kid, what's going on? I'm like, nothing. Everything's fine. It's great here. I love it. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Except that I know you pretty well and I need you to tell me what's going on. Right. And I told her. I told her everything. Grandma's the most stoic woman I've ever met in my entire life. Grandpa you were her baby. (laughs) Yeah. Grandpa says he's only seen her mad twice. And this Navy man, Navy retiree, mind you, uh, literally blanches and is like, I don't want to ever get her mad at me. Like, ever. that's the first time I ever saw grandma upset. And she kept her cool, but you could see it. So we made a plan. There was no way my mother was going to give me up without a fight. So at this point, grandma had been paying for a private Christian school. Uh, My mother wanted to homeschool us, um, but grandma was like, yeah, I know you better than that. You barely passed high school. No, (laughs) Jesse's a really smart kid. She needs to be educated. And so I was in second grade at this little private Christian school. So we made a plan. I was going to pack as much things as I wanted to take in my backpack for the day. 
I was going to go to the school. Grandma was going to drop me off at the school on her way to the airport. So we go to the school, we sit down with the principal, we explain the situation, grandma gets out all of the paperwork that says that she has rights to um, access to me, she is my full guardian, and we got on a plane and went home. So you went to the school as like a decoy? Uh Uh-huh. And then you and grandma skipped town. So, but because she had rights to you... It wasn't considered kidnapping, was it? It was not. Right. Because it so, felt like it, but it wasn't. Right. Because I'm thinking like when I went, so when I went through my divorce and my first relationship and I was moving out of the area for, you know, reasons to keep myself safe, I informed my ex-partner, my ex-spouse that I was taking my son with me and the the reason I could not take him with me was because we both had rights. And so I know enough that you can, if you have rights, you can move your child or prevent your child from moving to another County. But if you don't have legal rights, correct, then you're just a sitting duck. I think. Yep. So Jesse, uh, explain to me all of the road signs that have that like, have always like, have like have the kidnapping like signs, that, the Amber Alerts, things like that happen across the state at least the Uh country and stuff too. Almost most of those cases are situations like you're describing where it's a, where it's a spouse or, 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 um, you know, somebody who does not have rights, take the kid with them and leave. Usually it's most of the time. It's usually those cases. Uh, As far as I know. Yes. But yours wasn't, I mean, this was pre Amber alert, but this wasn't that because, Grandma, in the eyes of the law, was your legal guardian, correct? Grandma was my legal legal guardian, correct. So she could take you. Yes. And mom could do nothing. Absolutely. Well, she can be very upset. And but she, she can't I, I, And she it. was. Yeah. Yep. So I'm thinking, you know, in as a reasonably sane, somewhat normal parent <laughs> that I am, you know, if that was to happen to my kid, I'd be breaking down the walls and, you know, trying to get my child back. But in the, yeah, I'm wondering now your mom who may have had some troubles with, you know, dealing with reality, which extreme was she on? Did she run after you and try and get you back? Or did she say good riddance? It's a great question. It's also a loaded question. Um, So there was some back and forth with lawyers Uh, The lawyer in uh, Washington State, uh, the judge, I'm sorry, in Washington State, when this went to court, and my grandparents fought very hard to keep me off the witness stand, um, basically told my mother that not only should I not have custody of Jesse, um, but you should not, there should be question on whether you should keep custody of your other two children. Wow. The judge in North Carolina said the same thing and then also said, if this case ever comes back to court, I'm claiming full jurisdiction over this case. So put a pin in that. Six months after I moved back in with my grandmother, uh, we were living in a, they had moved from Vashon Island while I was gone to a cute little retirement trailer park here in Kent, Washington. And with a tiny little yard, it was a sweet little community and there was a pool down the road. And at the end of the road, like two blocks away, there was the mailboxes, right? And so every day, grandma and grandpa would, we would have dinner, like after school, we would come home, I would watch cartoons, I'd do homework, we would have dinner. And then grandma and grandpa would wash the dishes and then take a walk down to pick up the mail. And this, they could see the trailer, the whole way there and back. Um, And this was kind of their excuse to sort of step away from a very hyperactive seven-year-old, right? Right. Um, my mother, in the meantime, had gone to a conference and met the national director of WEBA, a woman named Mary Sue. Um, Mary Sue had been told that my grandparents were abusive, that they had kidnapped me, they didn't have rights to me, the judges wouldn't listen, and all of the other stories that my mother liked to make up. And so Mary Sue agreed to fly out to Washington Uh, They stalked me for three days, um, following the bus to and from school, watching the trailer. And when grandma and grandpa went for a walk, 
I was listening to Bing Crosby's Christmas album because it was December 7th, 1985. And I'm dancing around bare feet in my dress up clothes, listening to Bing Crosby. And there's a knock on the door. And being a seven year old, I answer the door. And there's a woman there that I've never seen. And she says, Come quickly, your mommy's in the car. And I went, Now hang on a minute. I know this. I know this. Stranger danger. Right. No, ma'am, I don't go with strangers. And she looked very startled and she goes, You're a very good girl, and turned around and walked away. And I was just gobsmacked. And so I shut the door and I was like, okay, this is weird. I better call one of my aunties because my aunties both lived within a few blocks of our neighborhood. I walked over to the phone, picked it up, started to dial and the door burst open. And my mother, all five foot 10, 300 pounds of her, stormed through the door, grabbed me by the arm, kicking and screaming, dragged me down the wooden steps. I had splinters in my arms and hands. Um, Understand it is December, I am barefoot. And drags me across the gravel and throws me in the back of the car next to my nine-month-old little brother. Wow. Who immediately begins screaming because I'm screaming. And then we peel out of the parking lot. Um, My mother turns around and starts yelling at me for upsetting my little brother. Like, how dare you? You need to get your shit together. And by the time my grandparents got back from the walk, there were six police cars in their driveway. Because a neighbor had seen it happen and had called 911. We drove from Kent, Washington to Oregon State, crossing state lines, which now made this a federal offense, and the FBI got involved. Um, We pulled over to a gas station. I am still sobbing. And my mother comes to the back of the car. She gets down next to me and she says, do you want to talk to your grandmother? And I said, yes. And she said, okay, I'm not going to let you if you're crying. Mm. And so I pulled my shit together. Okay. And she carried me over because I was barefoot. She carried me over to the phone booth. I don't know if anyone here remembers phone booths back in the day. Right. Yeah. yeah the, the word, the word, uh, accordion style door. To, like, <laughs> there you go. Climb think, in, yeah. think Bill and Ted's excellent adventure. It's like that yes. old, right? <laughs> yes. And so we go into this freezing cold telephone booth and mama puts a quarter in and dials the number. And my grandmother, once again, very stoic. I've never heard her raise her voice until this moment. And I could hear her through the phone screaming at my mother, Dolores, you bring my grandchild back this instant. And my my mother, cool as a cucumber, do you want to talk to Jesse? And she hands me the phone. And I said, grandma, And she said, Jesse. And I just lost my shit. Mm. And my mother grabbed me uh, by the arm, uh, threw open the door, and threw me out onto the ground and shut the door. And Mary Sue came over and picked me up and put me in the back of the car where I immediately fell asleep. When I woke up, we were pulling into a tiny little house in a tiny little neighborhood in a town that I don't know. And we were staying with another member of Weba. And my mom nursed the baby until he fell asleep. Uh, Mary Sue was in the other room asleep. I was laying in a pile of blankets on the floor. Mama was on the couch. It was dark. It was quiet. And, and at this mother, point, you have no idea how long you were asleep for, where you're at, how far you've gone. Like completely, like you're just at this age, how old now? So you're seven years old. You've had this super traumatic experience. Are you still barefoot at this point? Yes. Yeah. So like in your dress up clothes, you were just a a seven year old getting excited for Christmas to come. And now you've literally been ripped away from everything and you don't know how to get to safety or how to tell anybody even where to find you. Is that accurate? That is accurate. So it's night now. And my mother darts in on me very quietly so no one else can hear. Um, basically telling me what a bad little girl I am. And she was like, why did you betray the family this way? And what, 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 what is wrong with you? And I told her what Papa had been doing to me every night. And she got real quiet 
And she goes, oh God, tell me you didn't tell your grandmother that. Rolled over and went to sleep. And the had only time you we told ever talked you, about it. Had you told your grandmother? I had. Yeah. So we get home to Taylorsville. Um, we flew home. I was dressed as uh, Jeremy, Mary Sue's aborted son, she assumes. And I flew home with her in the back of the plane. Uh, Mama, wearing a wig and sunglasses with the baby, flew home in a different part of the plane. And we landed in Atlanta. From what I understand, there were two FBI agents on the plane. They were watching me, but they were waiting to find Mama. And they lost us in the Atlanta airport. So we go home. Back to the same house. I don't know how she thought this was going to work. The next morning, I hear a ruckus out the back side of our house. The driveway uh, went from the street all the way past the house to the back of the house. And then there was a back door, which the front door was always locked. We never used it. Um, So three police cars come roaring up our driveway. And Papa came into my room and put me in um, my coat. It was blue. And passed me out the back window to a neighbor who ran me over to her house and I hid in the closet for two hours. And then I was in hiding for a little over two years after that. Uh, Passed from family, all the families who were a part of this cult um, that my mother was involved in. I went from this house to that house to this house, different times, sometimes the middle of the night. There was a lot that happened. So during this time frame, uh, is it safe to assume you weren't allowed to return to school and continue your education? Because if I'm thinking, because I'm an educator and my background is mandated reporter, I see a kid come in. Of course, first place that the cops are going to look is at the school. They're going to be watching the school to see whether or not you show up. And the minute that you do, they're going to let your principal know you have to report, here's what's happening. And so you're not getting educated. You're now in this situation where you're the biggest secret that this community is keeping. And in their demented minds, they're thinking they're doing this for your own good. Correct. And you're just a scared little girl that wants to go home to grandma. And so this takes you up to, if I'm getting the timeline correct, around age nine or 10. Yep. And so I know that the story of your book, which we're going to talk about shortly here, is called Girl Hidden. I'm guessing that this might be where that title came from. Yes. So, I mean, you were physically hidden, but as you moved beyond, once whatever happened, which I don't want to give it away for the purpose of your your memoir and your story about how you were able to come out of hiding. But moving beyond that, from the age of 10 until you met your now husband, a little bit of a different question is, did that mentality of being hidden in emotional ways and physical ways carry as a pattern through your life where you felt like you couldn't quite be yourself? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, And I also, I've been diagnosed with ADHD as an adult too. So I was always told my whole life, I was always the loudest one, the biggest personality in the room. I was always told to make myself smaller. And so I learned very early on how to mask, how to mask uh, my relationship with my stepfather, with my mother, um, my friends, things I was and wasn't allowed to talk about. My parents were um, both emotionally as well as verbally and physically violent. Um, And we were taught how to handle when social services was called on us, Mm -hmm. which was often. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah. So you went through life hiding behind a mask. At what point do you feel like you got to the point where you could actually start taking that off 
and we'll see how old am I now? Self. Yeah, 46. 46, you said. You said. <laughs> yeah, like, or have you been able to? Um, it's so after I moved out of the inner city commune and moved out here to Seattle, I started seeing a really amazing therapist, and I cannot recommend therapy enough. It is so good. Um, and I was with that therapist for eight years. I am still in therapy off and on, depending on the year. Um, and going to therapy was very helpful in in the fact that I could like tell these stories, the things that happened when I was growing up, and have someone look me dead in the face and go, Yeah, that's messed up. Right. That's 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 kind of sick. Like so when I, oh, after I moved to the inner city commune, um, there are rules when it comes to the opposite sex. You are not allowed to sit with at dinner time anyone of the opposite sex who is not a family, quote unquote, family member or uh, a part of your given family at the ministry. Um, and you are not allowed to talk with them. So if you see someone you're interested in, then you go and talk to your family head. And if your family head thinks that you are ready, they will go and talk to that person's family head. And after you have lived in the ministry for a year, your family heads will decide whether or not you would be a good match. And if you are spiritually and emotionally ready for a relationship. Now, three days after I moved to the ministry, uh, I... Hmm, saw a gentleman get off the elevator. He had long, dark hair, um, olive complexion, glasses, green eyes. And he got off the elevator and walked up the stairs. And I went, who is that? <clears throat> and my friend Amy goes, uh, that's Leonard. Oh, honey, everybody gets a crush on Leonard. You'll get over it. And I was like, no. <laughs> Not happening. <laughs> No, you have to understand, I was 19. Leonard was 31. Yeah. And I had been trained since I was five years old that it is my responsibility to care for older men. Right. Now, as a as a 31-year-old, would I go out with someone who's 19? No. Are you kidding me? Not right. a chance on hell. But he had been in the ministry for 10 years and just needed to find the right woman and La la la. Anyway, so eventually we started dating. We got engaged. At that point, I figured I should probably let my family know what's going on. Um. So I and said, at this point, who did you view as your family? Was it grandma and grandpa, or was it your mom? I didn't meet my grandmother again until I was twenty-one. <gasps> oh, yeah. Apparently. Huh. And I have I have the court documents for this. I've heard the story from grandma, but I actually have the court documents. The case went to trial again after mama was arrested. She was in jail for exactly three days because her church, quote unquote, the culture that she was a part of, wrote a myriad of letters to the sheriff's office and to the judicial branch in our county. Um, begging for her release, explaining that she was a mother and what a good woman she was and what an incredible part of the community she was. Mama had also joined a group called um, the Lalechi League, which is still around today. I don't know if you oh, I'm familiar. Uh, know about them, mm -hmm. but it's basically it's a it's a pro nursing organization and they work with you to be able to successfully be a nursing mother. And mama had a nine month old and was still nursing. And so they wrote a bunch of letters saying that, you know, it is extremely detrimental for a newborn baby to be away from their mother and yada, yada, yada. And mama got out of jail. Um, Papa was never um, arrested. They did at some point, and I'm, I don't actually know what the date or time was, but they actually brought in a social worker to interview me to see if I had been abused. Now, once again, CPS is much better now, but I actually have the tape oh, wow. of me, little me with my little Southern accent, telling this social worker, this adult male 
social worker, everything that my mother told me to say. And then when he point blank asked me what was going on with Robert, with my stepfather, I just said, I want to go home. Yeah. And he said, there's no proof that Jesse has been abused. Yeah. So wow. Robert never got arrested. Well, Jesse, your story, I know we've just heard a brief snapshot of it, is so deep and there's so many different layers of it. How did you even get started writing it? Because I'm thinking like from a, a writer's perspective, there are so many different storylines that intersect in so many different directions where you could go that if it wasn't well thought out, it could just come out as a jumble, but you had to build this story, which means you had to rebuild it and process it deeply. Like, how did you even go through that other than with a lot of therapy? Oh, a lot of therapy. (laughs) (laughs) Um, It took me 25 years to write. Mm. It did. It took me 25 years. And here's the reason. Uh, After the second kidnapping, after I uh, was in hiding, I lost my memory. Um, Clean. I went to bed one night and when I woke up, I couldn't remember my grandparents. I couldn't remember my aunties. All I had any knowledge of was that they were people that existed and that was it. Why do you think that is? Well, A lot of times, children who have experienced traumatic experiences like this, their brain will literally shut off that section to protect you so that you can survive. It's like a PTSD response. It's like to keep your brain out of constant fight or flight mode. Uh It does things like that to insulate. And I think that I've heard that from survivors of sexual abuse and of so many other types of violent forms of abuse where they literally have gaps in memory for years. And people will ask them about things that happened that they remember during that time span, like a birthday party or something like that. And it's as if that time didn't even exist. Yep. It's like you're missing a chunk of your life. It's just gone. Wow. Um, I did remember, I did retain the memory of the kidnapping. So I knew mama wasn't safe. Um, And I retained the memory of everything that had happened with Robert. Mm. So I knew he wasn't safe. And that was it. I basically started my life over at the age of seven. When I was 15, I started getting flashbacks. And I had flashbacks well into my 30s. Of like a sound, a song, Mm -hmm. a smell. And all of a sudden, I'm transported back to being five years old. Where am I? What's happening? And having to walk through all of those things, very challenging. The other thing that was challenging in writing this story is I know my mother's version of this situation and how it happened. But what is true is not necessarily what mama says. Mm. So I would write like a a story or a chapter of the book or whatever and be like, okay, walk through that. All right, I'm done. I did this thing. And then I would pick up one of the boxes and start going through it and find another pile of court documents and go, wait a minute, my mother's full of shit. What? No, no, that's not. That's not what happened at all. And so in the process of writing this book, I started calling and interviewing people and um, sending letters and communicating with people who are on the other side of this story to find out their version of events. Right. And then even, I mean, gosh, the book's been out for two years now and I'm still learning stuff. So as an example, as an example, when I was growing up living with the Taylors, the entire time that I lived with them, There was always an unwed mother, usually a very young woman, in our home giving birth at some point. She would live with us for a couple of months. She would have the baby. The baby would would go one way. She would go another way. I never understood what was going on. When I was 14, there was a young lady in our town. And you have to understand, the town that we lived in at the time was... um, mm, small southern town. I don't know if it's a sundown town, but if it's not, it 
probably is, you know. Mm -hmm. They actually had Ku Klux Klan rallies in the main, like, in front of the courthouse on a regular basis. Wow. Um, Black people did not hang out with white people in my town. It was not acceptable. And a young lady whose parents went to our church at that time um, had gotten pregnant by a black man. And the pastor had sat his par- the parents down and said, if you don't manage this situation, you're going to have to find another church. Oh, wow. So we lived, at that point, we were living in the farmhouse, um, which was 30 miles outside of town, uh, so far out in the sticks that people from the boondocks would come out to see what the real sticks looked like. (laughs) We had 18 acres of land, um, two freshwater springs, and a big gray barn, and a 110-year-old house uh, that was, we grew up, I grew up in a lot of filth. It was very gross. And we had, my mother um, had seven children after me um, and two more abortions and two miscarriages. So she's, I think we figured out she'd been pregnant after the last one, uh, a full 18 years of her life. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And that'll mess with you anyway. I, I digress. Um, so mama picked this 16-year-old girl, uh, Autumn, Uh, up and brought her and her pregnant self out into the middle of nowhere. No phone, cut her off from her friends, from her family, and from the father of her baby. And then basically put her through two months of boot camp. You can't support a child. You don't have a job. You, You Let's go look at how expensive diapers are, yada, yada, yada. Meanwhile, I'm caring for Autumn along with all of my other chores and taking care of both of my parents. Um, I cooked and cleaned and uh, took care of the farm, milked the goats, milked the cows, fed the chickens, fed the rabbits, taught school, long story. And I was also taking care of Autumn. She'd throw up, I would clean it up. Um, I was her one and only friend at 14. Two o'clock in the morning, one blustery day, my light turns on next to my bed. And it's Autumn. And she goes, Jesse, I don't feel good. And I was like, well, all right. You want to come lay in bed with me for a minute? And we'll just talk. We'll just talk. And so we're sitting there. We're chatting for about a half hour. And I was like, you seem like you're doing better. And she goes, yeah, it's weird. It kind of comes and goes. Mm. Huh. Okay. Now, at this point, I've already delivered my little sister. I know what labor looks like. Well, wait a second. You're talking about childbirth. (laughs) I'm like, yeah, that's labor. So I went and woke mama up. I was like, hey, we're going to have a baby today. She's like, cool. I'll call the midwife. I'm going back to bed. Cool. So 12 hours later, mm, something like that, Autumn uh, gave birth on my bed, um, in my bedroom. The adoptive parents were downstairs. And Autumn got to see her little girl. And then my mother took the baby and walked out of the room. Mm. Autumn started to bleed out. Mm. Uh, She started hemorrhaging and blood was dripping off the side of my bed onto the floor. And I'm grabbing towels to clean it up. The midwives started packing their things because neither one of them were licensed to be delivering a baby. Mm. So they had to be out of the vicinity before we called 911. Oh, crap. Yeah. So we hear the fire truck roll up and I'm trying to get Autumn to keep her eyes open. And my mother comes in and hands me my baby sister, Faith, the the one I delivered. And uh, so Faith is seven or eight months old at this point. She hands me Faith and she hands me my tennis shoes. And she says, run, they will catch you if they find you here. And so I took my little sister. I ran out the door as the firefighters and the ambulance crew were coming down the walk. I ran around the house barefoot, down the hill, across the bridge uh, where the creek was, back up through the woods and into the three-acre fescue field. And I ran until I couldn't run anymore. And then I collapsed. And I lay there in the dark with this baby for three hours in the cold, wondering how they were going 
to come find me. Mm. So in the course of writing this book, the cops, I found out later, had shown up. And according to my mother, uh, the lead detective in this particular situation had been trying to get something on my mom for a while. And so he called for a canine unit because we have a little girl who's had a baby and there's no baby, which means there's a dead baby on this property somewhere. And my mother refused to turn over any paperwork. Now understand, of all of the young women that came through our home when I was growing up, who gave birth in our home as I was growing up, this was the one and only time that there was actually paperwork. Mama just liked to give people babies that she thought was worthy. So fast forward 25 years, right? And I am doing all of this research. So I call the sheriff's office. And I was like, look, this is going to sound crazy. This is the situation that happened. This is the year that it happened. Um, I just, I just want to know, is there any like case files? Is there anything? And the secretary or whoever answered the phone is like, hang on, let me ask around. Two minutes goes by. All of a sudden, a guy gets on the phone and he's like, this is Sheriff so-and-so. And And I was like, well, hello, Sheriff so-and-so. And he's like, what happened? And so I tell him this story. And he's like, I was the detective on the case that day. Hang on, one of my deputies was also with me. He's gonna wanna hear this too. A minute goes by, he gets back on the phone and apparently half of the department had me on speakerphone at that point. And he's like, tell us your version of this story. So I tell him the story. And I was like, what happened? And he's like, your mother had legal documentation that the adoptive parents had taken the baby and signed the paperwork. We couldn't do anything else. And I was like, okay, cool, 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 cool. At least that part is now information I know is fact. And he goes, um, do you, do you happen to know what happened to the baby? He's mm. like, it's been 25 years and I just never knew. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to make your day. Yes, sir, I do. She went to a wonderful family. I have photos of her from like Facebook. I'm friends with a friend of a friend. Um, She grew up, went to college, had a wonderful life, and her name is Grace. And these detectives started laughing through their tears. It was incredibly precious. So I tell the story on my TikTok. Hey, this is one of the experiences that I had. Here's a clip from the book. And somebody says, oh, I see. So your mother was a human trafficker. Mm Mm-hmm. No, because, huh. And this was a, this was this past year. And I had to like reevaluate everything that I thought about how my mother handled these situations and recognize all over again from a completely different perspective the abuses that happened to all of these young women. Anyway, so that's, yes. There was a lot of research. There was a lot of, Uh, healing that happened in the course of writing this book. And there was also, it it took a lot of work to put all of the correct dates into perspective. Right. Mm -hmm. Especially going, if you're basing it on memory, you know, memory can be a bit foggy during those times, like you said. Right. You forget things, uh, you know, that kind of stuff. So the question I have really with the the mother, with your mother in the the children um, that were being pawned off, was there any cash involved, uh, any kind of money monetization being used? You know, it's funny. I actually get that question a lot and I honestly don't know. I don't know. We grew up incredibly poor, incredibly poor. Uh, My stepfather was in the Marine Corps when I first moved in with them and my mother decided that it was too much work for her to raise children on her own and for him to be gone twice a month to the reserves. And so she made him quit. So Papa basically worked odd jobs and we were, from what I understand, we were about $10,000 a year below the poverty line in the 1980s Mm. with nine mouths to feed. Right. And a farm and dogs and cats and chickens and a couple of mice, but they weren't really invited. (laughs) Well, Jesse, this story is just, I mean, it's deep and... It 
definitely is something that I think a lot of people can relate to different aspects of your story. Maybe not the entire timeline is like somebody's like, oh, that's my story. But you touch on so many different components of, you know, narcissistic parents overcoming, uh, enduring and overcoming and healing from sexual abuse, um, being kidnapped and trafficked and hidden and, you know, all of these different components. So for our listeners that are out there right now that are totally into your story and want to know more about your journey, where can they find your book? So the name of the book is Girl Hidden for obvious reasons. Um, and girlhidden.com is my website. It's got a lot of information about uh, me and the book and places that you can purchase it. Uh, we also did an audio book, mostly because I haven't read anything in like 10 years. I barely <laughs> ever pick up books anymore. I used to be an avid reader. Now I'm an avid listener. I listen to audiobooks all the time while I garden. It's amazing. And so we did an audiobook and the young lady who did the audiobook was just chef's kiss. She was so good. I actually had to stop listening at one point and call her up to tell her how freaked out I was about the way that she played Robert because it was on point. Oh wow. So good. So the audiobook and is available anywhere you get your podcasts. Um, it's also available through Audible, and you can purchase the paperback copy um, through any of your local bookstores as well as on Amazon. Fantastic. That's amazing. Well, Jesse, we so appreciate you taking just a small part of your weekend to be here with us and to share your story. I know that walking through it can be hard and also healing at the same time. And so we appreciate you allowing us to hold space for you today. And we hope that the more that you talk through it, the more that you heal and the more that you feel that you're helping others, the more empowered it makes you. I do. I absolutely do. When I got to the end of writing this book, when I got to the point where I was like, mm, I probably need an editor. Um, I realized that I had somewhere in the recent past stopped writing it for me and started writing it as a survival guide mm. for people who have lived through these experiences. And I swear there's not a week that goes by that I don't have someone in my DMs telling me their story or saying, I've always wanted to write my story. This is what happened. And I, I'm very encouraging for the love of God, write it down. It makes it makes things so much clearer and it helps you walk through these things. But my book does come with trigger warnings, just, just so you know. And I right. do have that in the beginning of the book as well. Um, but thank you guys so much for having me on your show. I'm just so honored and I so appreciate your questions and for uh, inviting me to come and be a part of this. Thank you so much, thank Jesse. You. Are you in the middle of wedding planning and feeling overwhelmed? There's no need to fret, my friend. Christine Smith Designs is here to rescue you. Offering wedding planning, coordination, and wedding floral design services, let us help relieve your stress and make your wedding day dreams a reality. Visit us at christinesmithdesigns.com. That's K-R-I-S-T-I-N-E smithdesigns.com and request a free consultation. You'll be so glad you did. You know, that was so great for Jesse to sh share her uh, incredible story with us and be so open about it. And uh, wow, you know, like that's crazy. The things she had to go through as a child at, at seven years old, you know? Right. And to go through so many different, really traumatic instances and to come out on the other side as an individual who is now speaking to telling her story and inspiring others and helping them to get on their own journey of healing and recovery. It is very, it's very inspirational and it's a great reminder that without trying to like make this just about positivity, that no matter what you've gone through, that when you come out on the other side, your story has power to help others. Definitely. Yeah, for sure. Because you just never know. There's somebody that could be walking in those exact shoes at the moment they hear this. Right. And what I was thinking about is even though you and I have very different life experiences from Jesse, there are parts of her story of, you know, going through her divorce and, you know, finding love again. And, you know, she didn't share all of that in the interview, but she does talk about it through her TikToks and what her journey was. Uh, 
that you that I could connect with and I could see myself in her story. And I think that uh, she can, she's very relatable. And I feel that I'm very excited to pick up a copy of her book and to see, you know, what else I can gather out of her story. Yeah, definitely. For sure. You know, like it's, um, it's definitely eye opening for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And so, uh, where can our listeners find out more about Jesse and her story and her resources, Chris? Well, I did put a link to her website all in the show notes of this episode. Okay. And where else can they find it? Well, we have our website, which is Chris and Christine show.com with all information about us and all the episodes and all the details obviously will always be in the show notes of this episode. You scroll on down and you'll have everything you want to need to know right there. Yep. But if you choose to go over to our website and find out more about this episode and more about us, you can also learn more about Chris and his podcast engineering and production services with Podtastic Audio. And you can also hop on over to Christine Smith Designs. You can check out our YouTube videos of our family adventures, find out more about us and our relationship. And we always invite you, if you've loved this episode and learned something from it, to get, definitely hop on over, leave us a review on one of our review platforms, and save and share this episode with others. Right, Chris? Fantastic. Couldn't said it better, baby. Absolutely. And so thank you all for listening. We really appreciate you and you being part of our K2 media crew. Is that what we call everybody? <laughs> our K2, uh, K2 crew, baby. The K2 crew. And we'll be back with you next, next week. week.